Oh, welcome to the session on lambdas, lambdas everywhere. And uh, chatting with some of you before in the room, and also welcome to those who are watching. This is a session that's primarily focused on Lambda functions in Visual C++ 2010, and also implementing ISO C++ OX Lambdas. Uh, my name is Herb Sutter. I'm an architect on the Visual C++ team. I chair the Standards Committee. And even if the primary experience you might have had in some other languages, notably C Sharp, I know a lot of you have used C Sharp Lambdas, you will find a lot that's familiar, and you'll also find things that you can't do in some other languages, some extra knobs, such as capture by value, capture by reference. You might use those. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a tour of what you can do with Lambda functions, and there's in an hour. So what I've tried to do is to pick illustrative examples where we're going to begin a, with a brief overview of what Lambda functions are and how you actually mean. So I'm not going to assume you know what they are, but we'll have a quick overview of what they are. But then I'm going to show you example after example after example as in one hour of how you use them. And the key takeaway that I as talk is as many people have already found out in C Sharp, that once you have Lambda, which is the ability to treat a piece of code like an object, it's it's functor. It's just syntactic sugar for writing a function object on the fly. That's all it is. The key thing is example but the sheer number of them the sheer number of them so when you walk out that door I am expecting that you might remember one or two of the examples but the main thing is look how many there are and how many places this is useful as you may have already discovered in using lambdas in your system of choice so we're going to begin with a basic syntax and a toy example from years ago that now suddenly becomes almost compilable code that was never possible before then we're going to talk about effective STL using algorithms and what lambdas make possible there, especially for high performance code. Algorithms, including an example if you've ever had C sharp lock block envy or Java synchronize block envy, well, you already know you can do something very similar with just about the same syntax in C, but wait till you see how close. We're going to talk about parallelism. How do I use lots of cores to get the answer faster? This is not a treatise on that, but it's saying, okay. How do I write the code using something like PPL or TPL? And how does Lambda functions make it much cleaner to write that code, and especially to take sequential code and make it concurrent? And then we're going to have some dessert. Again, just showing a small example of yet another place. Yet another place. And this can help us. So let's get started with the basic syntax. The basic syntax just starts with some square brackets, optionally empty, that just basically tables in the local scope you want to capture. If you're in a member function, this may be one of those variables. And then you have a simple function definition. You have your parameters. You have the new style C++ OX function return type at the end of the return, which is just used pervasively in C++ OX. But you put decal type and stuff at the end if you know what that is. That's the reason it's in the entire language. It's very helpful here. And then just as much code as you want to put into the body of the any other function. So really, this is just like any function, except it's got this capture list in front. As, oh, by the way, capture some local variables and pass them along. And up so it can be invoked later, possibly multiple times. So the first set of square brackets is the capture list, option then the parameters, the return type, the body. And when you actually use this, let's say you've got a widget object in scope. And you want to write something, a lambda, that captures this widget by value. So you put w in there. There are shorthands, which we'll get to. w, I want to use that name. And then I go whatever code I want there. In this case, just a loop that uses w and passes it to a function. Now, I capture that in an auto, which is like, I don't have to say the whole type again, which is a good thing, because that's, it's a for a lambda. And then I just go and invoke it function. All this is doing is creating a function object. I had wanted to capture w by reference, that is, make a copy of the widget but refer to the original one right where it was. I just put an ampersand in front. So I capture it by reference. And by the way, in the second example, we're also showing how to take a parameter so that when you invoke the lambda, you actually pass it additional information which can vary from call to call. So how does this generate it? lot like using functors if you're used to function objects. 
Well, if you look at these two parts, the character list and the function body, just to a function object in the following way. A function object has a constructor. That constructor runs at the time that you take the lambda. It runs right away. It captures whatever you want or by reference. And here you see it, it makes private variables of those types capture the values or the references inside the function object, and the constructor passes them through to initialize it. And then you go your merry way and carry a little bundle of joy around until sometime somebody invokes it, in which case a darker box comes into play, which just simply turns into the function call operator. No magic, it just turns into the function call operator with exactly the same nature and exactly the same body. And when you first see that, you might say, well, what's the point? It, this gives me absolutely nothing I couldn't have already anyway because I already had function objects. Oh, but it gives us such an important difference. It gives us the power to write them without having to go somewhere else in the code, out of scope to write yet another code. In C-sharp, you don't have to go somewhere else to write a delegate. You can do, do everything and we'll see how important that is. But it's pure tactic sugar for functors. So for example, if I'm trying to capture variable C1 by value, C2 by reference, notice I've just got private state, C2 by value, and a reference to C2. And my functor constructor just captures those things. And finally, every time that I invoke the function call operator, I just pass, capture, use that captured state. Notice I'm accessing now the captured variables. And I pass those to F. So in this case, there's no additional parameters. Notice they've defaulted away. If I'm not passing any additional parameters on each and I don't need to write that other stuff, the square bracket, the round brackets, the arrow. And I get a pretty nice, concise syntax for saying, here, make something that when invoked this and then use it however I want. On the, let's just say, on, on the other hand, I don't want to capture anything. I don't want to take certain parameters, parameter one by value, parameter two by const reference. Well, that just generates no constructor or member variables, as you can imagine, is quite efficient. And a function call operator asked whatever you said and then uses it. It's just almost like, but it's in the language, it's in the type system. So you use these. Here's the first toy example. If you're a follower, if you've ever read Guru of the Week, the internet column I wrote, which became the book on C++, then you'll have noticed, oh, way back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, this example, and which turned into more exceptional C++ item 33, I have a function f, and I have stuff, I have a local variable j, and then I would like to do the red code, which is illegal. This is not legal C++. I cannot write a nested function, which I would like to do, because you're supposed to make things with as small scope as possible. It's only going to be used and why should I ever expose it anywhere else? But I can't write in G that takes a K. And inside G, it would return J plus K. J is that outside F's local variable that I'm accessing. And K is the parameter. At the return line, I want to return the value of G invoked with the value 3. So this is what I would like to write, but I can't write it. And I also have to decide, at the time that I invoke G of 3, did I want the value of j as it was when I created the lambda in the red line? In which case, the value would be i times 2. Did I want the value of j as it was at the time I invoked the lambda at the return statement, in which case it would have four added to it? One really corresponds to value. If it's, by value, it means I take a copy of j, and that's what the nested function is. So you get the original value at that point. By reference, it's get, you get whatever live value it's really got. By the way, copy by reference is what you do in C Sharp. All so if you use C Sharp, you're used to copy by reference. And sometimes if you've ever wanted to take a snapshot of value, especially for concurrency reasons and other side effects stuff, you can do this in C++ lambdas. Now, I'm not going to dwell on how you work around this in today's C++, but it, before, but let's just see how painful it was, because it's fun to watch pain. Basically, it boils I can't have a local function, but I can have a local class, and classes can have functions. It's just work around it by injecting things that way. So a local class, and basically in option one, notice basically doing what I just described Lambda's doing, but I'm doing it by hand. I'm capturing the variable j, 
by reference in this case, I could have done it by value, constructor of this local class, capturing it as the member j underscore. Then my function call op the int k, and it returns j underscore plus k, the captured value of j, in this case, a reference to the original j. And then finally, down at the bottom, I create a variable, little g, of this type, and I initialize it explicitly in the constructor with j. Capture j now. The constructor runs now. I have j there. Because it's by reference, when I invoke j3, I get the current value of j. So I capture the reference. If instead I had the value at the time I created the, the local class, the local uh, g, I would have just captured the value instead of by reference, just get rid of the ampersands. Some drawbacks in C++ 3, it's one of the workarounds. You could hack around it. Hopefully we agree this isn't very elegant. Eh, it works. We're used to ugliness for C++. Come on. Just kidding. Wait until it is. Now, you can, turns out you can generalize this trick. Now, some people might want to do this anyway, even if you have lambdas, but this is kind of cool. Let's say I'm going to create this struct, this local class anyway. You can do it in the following way instead. Tweak it a little bit. Actually make the sh variable that you want to capture would otherwise be a local variable. Make it a member of that local class. Make the class a struct just so things and you can access them. And then put the it was as a member. Now, you, because the variable's already there, you don't need to capture anything. The variable lives in that scope. This one only works well for, for by reference capture, by the way, because there's only one j. And name the stuck, struct local. It's got the local variables and the local functions that need those local variables. And then you just go ahead and invoke local.j equals i times 2, local.g of 3. Right? Now, then, why would you do it this way? Because once you do this, you could write as many more local functions as you want that all share the state. And this is one pattern that sometimes is useful to do. For now, let's not write so much code and see in, instead with lambda functions, what could we have written? If you go back to the original code, which I wrote 10 plus years ago and said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could write this? Today, with ISO C++ OX and its draft, with the Visual C++ 2010 compiler, you can write that code that never held change it very slightly in syntax, the word auto and a couple of parens, and it just works. Because what is a lambda? Well, it's a function object. It's something function-like. I can capture it in a variable, which gives it a name. Bingo. That's my local function. And I can use it exactly as I wanted to in the original problem without any fuss or muss with local classes or capture by hand. And if I want capture by value, instead of reference, I just change the ampersand to an equal sign, and I'm done. So that's kind of nice. So I could do all of this by hand, but isn't this ever so much more pleasant to deal with? And then I can get on to writing the rest of the logic I really want to care about. So that's a, one example just to get a taste. But there's so much more. Let's talk about STL. How many of you have enjoyed using STL in your careers or currently? You've not enjoyed it. Oh, there must be a story there. All right, we'll talk about Okay, so let me ask you if perhaps one mention is what you have not enjoyed because I'm about to admit that the that we told you to enjoy, that no, us, including us. So, here you go. In fact, F. Myers, C++ guru and personal friend, wrote effective STL and item 43, prefer algorithm calls like the colon colon for each, transform, copy. Prefer calling those instead of writing for loops and do while loops. Why? Well, many of the standard algorithms really are loops, like for, or score each, or transform, or find. Why are algorithms better? They come debugged for you. Second, they tend to come highly tuned. For instance, implementations of for each may automatically do your work n at a time and partly unroll a loop, and therefore will be faster than your naked for loop. And you didn't have to do anything. Clarity, probably the biggest key is we've raised the level at which we're speaking. When you read a naked for loop and you say for int i equals zero, i is less than, what do you immediately find? Your eyes sort of scan with, with your peripheral and you see what comes next and you see some plus signs. Plus, uh, this is a loop that iterates over every element. 80% of the time you're right. 
because maybe you didn't scan that right. Maybe it's unusual in the expression, because that's just a discipline. We're used to using this coding pattern. Maybe somewhere in the loop, you or, or your friend has incremented or changed the loop variable. So you skip stuff, or do stuff twice, or do something. You do not get to know by just seeing four and stopping and seeing no further what that loop does. You have to actually look at the body of the loop. For each cannot lie. It is going to go and touch each element in the collection exactly once. Transform is going to take one input or two inputs and produce output one for one elements. You do not have the body of anything. You don't have to even go past the word transform. Exactly what it will do. Find. These algorithms explain themselves. When you write, raises the level of your code because you exactly what's being asked for. It's a higher level, it's more specific. And this is a well vocabulary people can expect, be expected to learn. There are lots of reasons to prefer algorithm calls, and almost nobody does because it's so hideously inconvenient. Imagine a handwritten loop. This is effective STL at item 20, adapt for i equals strings begin, i doesn't equal str strings end, plus i will emit every element to C out to the console. Lambdas, the recommendation is to use the copy algorithm. Well, just copy input, which is strings.begin to strings.end, to this is the console. Oh, but wait, how do I write the console? Oh, remember, there's this special thing in STL that's an O stream iterator. I can tell it, oh, by the way, you're going to be for strings, repeating myself, and pass it C out and say, put a new line after everything. Just curious, how many of you looking at those two pieces, just by show of hands, find the first or the second easier to read? How many of you think that the first one's probably easier to read and write? Okay, I think that the second's probably easier to read and write? See <laughs> a single hand, all right. So, yeah, you can argue, oh, look, it's it's probably faster. In fact, it is probably faster. Hmm. But how would you write this with lambdas? Well, you would write it as you'd probably use the for each algorithm, which tells you you're doing a thing to every element. Each string in strings do, you string by reference as a parameter each time, see out, write an end line. Notice that that's almost exactly the same as the naked for loop. Because I've passed a lambda, a function object, as the thing to be done to every element in the collection, I can write arbitrary code. In fact, I've deliberately formatted that with KNR style line breaks. It looked like a loop because it is. This is just like another kind of loop as if built into the language. Pretty close. We'll talk a bit more about that. So I'm curious. I'll take that, that poll again three ways. Well, actually, just two ways since none of you voted for. So how many of you compared the, the original by hand, which we've all written a million times, and the for each loop, which may be the first time you've seen it, how many think that the for loop is clear to write and read, the for loop at the top? Okay. Wow. Like two or three? Okay. How many would vote for the for each is probably easier to write and read? Wow. I almost never, this is the second time I've ever got a majority on the first one. Usually it takes slides to get people comfortable because most people haven't seen this before. It's a pretty good indicator. Yeah, well, especially if you've been using C-sharp, that, oh, yeah, I know what this is. That's fine. So that's good. Now, newsflash is, you know, you go back to this previous example, the way we people to do it with STL without lambdas, we'd say, oh, just write a, a functor if you need key, and there was something called OStream iterator that did what we wanted to do. And you know, the helpers that work when you have one line bodies, Newsflash, functions are not one-line bodies, yet they work as well with lambdas. So here's a handwritten loop at the top that does things to every string. STL without lambdas, you get to for each, but then you got to go and write a functor to pass. That means you outside the scope of the function, write your 10 lines of boilerplate, and then the function body, because you got to write the constructor, capture, function, call operator, all that stuff. And it works. But almost nobody actually does this in the real world. We all know it works. I, one of us is probably, you might be one or two people in the room who, who have ever checked in a line of production code like that. It's genius. Because think about what you're doing. You're reading the code, never mind it. Because readers way outnumber writers, right? So we like to be good to them. 
and you read the code for each, okay, each string grows body functor. Okay, now where is that again? Use IntelliSense, go to and figure out what it's doing, how things are being passed. Okay, what variable is being copied? What's in scope? How does this all feed through? It's not pretty. You lose that locality of reference love just to be able to read what's happening. STL with lambdas, you write for each, and you write exactly the same loop as you would have written anyway. If you wanted to access local variables, you just capture them in the square bracket capture list, which here I'm I don't know what local variables you might capture. They just there, and if you just want to capture by value or by reference, you just put a character there, equals or ampersand, and you're done. So now I'm curious, uh, when you look at this, doesn't it seem like the top and the bottom look very much alike? That's what I tend to mean by, yes, you have to say strings begin and strings end, but it's a lot like having another kind of loop just built in. And you know as soon as you hit for each, you know what it does. There's no weird control flow possible. Now, it is true that in C++ OX, there is a range-based for loop that's also coming in. That if you're using C Sharp, you're very familiar with this. If you're using Java, you're familiar with the syntax even, which is the middle column with the middle code example for auto S in strings, colon strings, pronounced in. But now that lambda syntax calling the generic algorithm is not even compared to that built-in language feature that bad. And a forward-looking note in the future, this is not in the standard or in visual us today, when we have a few extra ranges in the STL, so you don't have to say begin separately, and when we have typed for function parameters, so you can just say auto, now the delta between the built-in hardwired language feature and the general purpose live function code, that's a generic algorithm, becomes very which is kind of interesting. So now let's look at another STL item, STL item 40. Let's find the first element that's in a vector v that is between the values x and y. So here's the handwritten loop. We have to declare the iterator to get outside the loop because we're going to use it after the end of the loop, right? We can't just say for i equals v begin. We have to make that a longer scope. So let's use that begin while i is less than or equal to n plus plus i is this element between x and y. And when I find one that is, I break. And now I have an iterator pointing to the first element between x and y. Problem solved. This today in STL without lambdas. Anybody shout out a rough idea? What algorithm might you reach for? Probably something like that, yeah, for each or find or something like that. Well, you probably would write find if. So find in a range from begin to end if this functor is true. But what's the functor that says is between x and y? Well, the way you can write it is composed to, and this is the way it is in Scott's composed to logical end of bool paren paren comma bind iterator of int paren paren comma x comma bind second left paren paren comma y paren 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 semicolon. Compiles, okay, I matched the parens correctly, or IntelliSense told me. Never mind the logical and were not standard. Logical and is now standard. Anybody going to write that? I mean, that is such an arbitrary theoretical artifact that is so far detached from the world. Yes, it works, but oh my. And it's not portable. So hence the comment, no, seriously, find that in print. And that's what the answer used to be. Now, today the answer is slightly better. Notice that's, that's today without lambdas in C++ OX. We bind first and bind second with just bind. We replace pose with using bind. Logical and standard. So now you can actually write that slightly more simply. Oh my goodness, really? Are we going to expect people will really do this? I don't think so. And I don't think I could tell you to do that. I expect you to believe me and not blush. So. How does this get better with lambda functions? Is, is it just a lost cause to use find if? With, I mean, the part is nice. It says what it does. But then the rest is such a fraud to have to spell out and tell it what to do. Wouldn't it be nice if we could pass a piece of code like an object, hmm, sounds like a function object, to find if? Well, that's what lambdas let us do. And so now we can just write, and this code will compile today. Find if from begin to end 
okay, lambda that takes the int and returns whether it's between x and y. I capture the equal says capture by I'm done. Now I'm curious what you think. I'm going to not ask you about the middle one because nobody can write that. But the first for loop, which we all can figure out what it does, and the lambda, the bottom example with find if, which maybe you've never seen before, which is more self-documenting? How many of you I can prefer the, the for loop as the first one being familiar probably? A few. That's okay, because so many of those that it becomes familiar. How many of you prefer the find if as being easier to read and write? More. Okay. So the comment is, but the for loop is because it's got the break in there and it's going to stop when you reach it. May I present a dissenting opinion? What you said is completely correct. You could read the for loop and see inside, oh, it's going to break when it does that. And you had to read the loop body to figure that out. Whereas with find if, as soon as I go to find if, before I even read the open parameter, I know it's going to visit every element and stop and return. And as this condition is satisfied, I only have to read on one in that figure out what the condition is. So uh, I'm not arguing that that's what you said is true of the break state. However, I think the same argument applies even better to find if, because I already know just from find if it's going to stop without even connecting the body. Okay. The use of I? So is the I in the first example not the I in the last example? Well, these are separate that are supposed to do the same thing. I is an iterator in the first one. And it is the same type in all of these. Each of, all of these deal in iterators. So I, I believe, I can come up afterwards and let me know if there's a mistake, but I believe all three of these lines are exactly identical, exactly the same semantics and types. Yes. Yes, it's confusing that I mentioned I as the iterator and also I as the local variable. Yes, you keep, I'm, I'm very egocentric. I like I. Yes. <laughs> hey, if it was good enough for Dennis Ritchie, it's good enough for me. And Don will too. But you're right, that's confusing. I could probably make it clearer with two different variables. But hey, we have scopes. Why not name variables popular names? Good point. So, you could also use first of or some of the other STL algorithms, and it would have worked similarly. Yes. So let's consider the example of accumulate, because accumulate's really interesting, because there are some performance issues here as well as performance issues. So look at the first piece of code. I want a vector of int values, and I want to sum values, and I want to multiply, find the product of the values. What do I do? Well, it's interesting. So sum equals zero, let's just ignore overflow and under this toy example. And product is a long, long as well, who knows how big that product might be. So let's just say I have some big, maybe even a big int type that's dynamic. And then I say for equals values again, values i done equal values end plus plus i. Some add, add star i product multiply star i. In STL without lambdas, probably the algorithm which for is accumulate. What accumulate does is it starts with a certain value and then takes that and you know plus equals times equals whatever you ask for to every other value in the sequence so I want to take the sum of values I say accumulate the D is plus so accumulate all the items from begin to end and start with the value zero well that's going to give me of all the things in the collection the sum will be the same as I calculated by hand you can also pass a functor that says I do, if you don't want plus, how do you override the default multiplies? And there happens to be a standard functor multiplies of int, so I'll pass you one of those as the last parameter. And by the way, one for multiplies, because that's the, the starting point for multiplies. And long, long product equals a huge, multiply them all out. So I've, I've really learned something here. Not only is it maybe less obvious, I had to type multiplies int and had to use that functor, maybe write my own if I want something that isn't already packaged in the standard. But I have written two examples, which means I'm doing what to the collection? 
for processing it twice, your cash will love you, right? So that's, actually it won't. Unless it fits in cash, this is going to hurt you. So we do not like to do multi-pass, especially for large collections. Did you notice also how easily we lost the long long? Because I had to go multiplies int, because I had to take ints that I multiply, which means the intermediate values are int, even though I store the result in a long long. Oops. There's an overflow waiting to happen. So it works, but there, you know, there's some gotchas because of the, there's this impedance barrier between you and what's actually happening inside the functor. So in STL with lambdas, you would write something like this. This is one way to do it. The first line is the same as before, the initialization, and then I just say for each, values begin, values end. Take the integer and add it to the sum and multiply it into the product. Did you notice that it's the same loop body I wrote up there? I just used for which declares my intent instead of the for loop. And you can decide for yourselves which is more self-documenting and they could accumulate or for each. Like for example, it has performance and, and type penalties. Just in terms of the clarity of the code, think about which one you might prefer. Now in case you're thinking about, oh yes, but this is C++, we're supposed to care about performance. Well, that's true. So, when you call generic algorithms, wait a minute, that's general, generally costs. There's an abstraction penalty, isn't there? Oh, you're using iterators. That's indirections, that's, that's little classes themselves, plus plus functions, that's gotta be expensive. Lambda's a function you're indirecting through and always calling this other function that's, that's wrapped up. Sounds pretty heavyweight. Well, before we released Visual Studio 2010, I did a little quick measurement. I decided to compare against the worst possible case, in this case, the, which is the fastest possible baseline. It's actually make the code more complex and make it yet faster. But it's hard to beat simple arithmetic and integer increment. And all we are doing here, character string, the array of characters, 52, 53 long, and we're using pointers to start at points to the beginning, increment, 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 and do and just increment each character. So we change to B, B to C, C to D. The key thing in the body, there are only two instructions. There is pointer dereference, pointer increment, uh, Increment and integer increment. Okay, that's three. That's it. Pointers and ints. It just, there's no conversions, nothing. It doesn't get much better than this. This is raw, raw, unchecked, everything access. If you, if you wrote 53 there, you'd be going a little bit off the end, as I did in an earlier version of this slide, and that's why it now says 52. Ah, there's a bounce checking. Well, what if we had a change that could be initialized to a, a, a type safe? over an array of characters, an iterator, like an array range that I built. And so it initialized with that, and it provides begin and end to each. So I made a version of for each that you could just pass to without making a naked begin and end. So for each is a generic algorithm that can work on any. It invokes begin and end member functions on this range. And for each is going to apply whatever you give it to every element. In this case, I'm passing a lambda function that takes a reference to a character. So again, there's this indirection. I mean, a reference to a character. Reference is a pointer. You're conceptually taking the address of something and incrementing the character. I mean, characters, pointers, ints upstairs, and algorithms and iterators and functors and everything down. And in the possible case that I tested, the worst combination compiler switches in that pre-release build of which was still being tuned, the worst case performance of the bottom over the top was 1.8x. And best case, it was 20% faster. Because lambdas love to be inlined. For algorithms, generic algorithms love to be inlined. Compilers take this and say, oh, I'll help you with that. For each does things like, oh, well, I'm in my for each implementation, I see you're having small actually unroll that loop for you. So when we're talking about using algorithms and lambdas, do not assume things are slow. If in this case, remember in this case when I measured the difference, I was trying very hard to measure almost purely overhead difference. Because the loop was essentially almost nothing. I was trying to measure pure overhead difference and make it as possible. So 
learned. Finally, we can say, prefer algorithm calls to handwritten loops, at least I can say it and not like I have to blush or run out the exit. And you still get the performance benefit if the loop is optimized for you, the algorithm already. The correctness, because it comes debugged out of the box. And the clarity, because you've raised that level of abstraction to say if or transform instead of for or while. Lambda works especially well for or equally well for loop bodies no matter how long, which means as soon as you write a new algorithm, you've pretty much written a new kind of loop without a little change. So conclusion, do you want a new loop or a new kind of feature? Write an algorithm, write a function, or a template in particular. So let's take a look at what it means and what you can do by writing your own new templates that amount to almost language extensions of this one nice language extension hook, lambdas, that easily bring them together. Let's say for each, and I've shown almost the entire thing here. I'm not going to bother with the body because you know what it is. Lines. For each element in a collection. So let's say I want to operate on a whole vector or something like that. And, but I want to do a step. You know, back in the basic days, you could do step whatever. Why can't we do that? I want my step back. So I'll just say step what, and then some functor to apply. And if you make it generic like that and make a template parameter, or that's a compile time, you can also function of std colon colon function of an, a signature. Look that one up if that's not familiar to you. And you can hold it indirectly. It's a type say function pointer that has, gives you conversions on the arguments and everything. It's really cool. Or do this, make it a template parameter, and now you can pass a lambda. You've enabled people to pass a lambda to that third parameter. So now, you've just written a new kind of loop, and I can write for each nth v3, for every widget, do the following. And if it's not in the language already, go at it. And it's not that much worse, not that much different from saying for, and it's at a much higher level of abstraction. Now, what about the do while loop? I've been beating on four, so can we beat on do while a little bit? Okay, this one isn't 100% pretty, but it shows that you get it fairly pretty. Instead of do for while not done, it would be very easy to tell you what the implementation of the do while algorithm is. You could probably write it yourself in two ways. Do while, lambda. Lambda one is the thing to do in each iteration. Capture things by reference, say comma, lambda, the thing that says return, not done. It's like, okay, when stop. So now there's two lambdas. Do x while y. Oh, by the way, this is your big chance if you love Pascal, and those of you who love C-sharp, I mean, we, we worship Anders, and he comes from Turbo Pascal. It's, it's all good, right? We should worship Pascal. Never mind Delphi. Have you repeat until? Yes, the until is the algorithm name rather than before the return done, and but right, repeat until and take away the at the not in front of done, and you can have something just as readable as well, with very little overhead syntactically. Now here's another one. Those of you who are familiar with C sharp or other languages, that you have this lock block. I want to lock a mutex. So if I lock a mutex, then I can use the thing it protects. In Java, you say synchronized. Already do the following in C++ OX. There's a thing called a lock act based variable whose constructor takes the lock. Constructor which runs at the end brace of the scope releases the lock even if there's an exception. You get all the niceness of the lock block using C++ lifetime semantics and RAII. You can already do that without lambdas or anything in C++ OX. Well, what do lambdas let you do? What if you really, really love syntax? Even you want the brace on the other side for some reason or something. You just love the syntax. You could easily just simply write your own two line once, your one line function template, algorithm said not functor. Write it once. It's about two. And just say lock, mutex, take the mutex to lock, and then the thing to do while holding the lock, and basically your the implementation is just what the, the previous code was. That's your body of it. It's two lines. Or spell it synchronized if you really like synchronized. And you're done. 
So you have a lot of flexibility here. Again, the, the point is this is enabled in this completely different scenario. Just because I can take a piece of code and pass it around like an object to be executed whenever, to be invoked whenever. So now let's look at an example from the world of parallelism and using lots of cores to get the answer faster. Here's a sequential loop such as we may have, might have written many times in our careers. Uh, we'll even use C-style syntax because that's popular in the day. Let's say you take a naked array of floats and a size, and for every element in those first n elements of A, I'm going to do foo of A sub i. That's what I'm going to do. Now, you could already do exactly the same thing as the top by writing it in the bottom. Do foo in the bottom that does a for loop, for underscore each. Same code as the top, just written using algorithms like half hour or so. So that's still sequential. There's no parallelism yet. So how would you do this in parallel? Well, if you used Intel threading building blocks up to version 2.1, you'd do as follows. You write parallel underscore 4. Look at the bottom of the screen first, because that's the good part. Parallel underscore 4, some blocked range thing of the, basically says from 0 to n. Apply foo of a. Well, that's really great. Uh, so what exactly are you doing on each loop iteration? I'm doing apply foo. Right. It's that. Oh, well, just look up here outside the function where in some class apply foo. Oh, it's, it has some, um, some float star that it remembers. Oh, look, there's a pointer down there that remembers a pointer to the array. Oh, I've got a function called a blocked range of int, whatever that is. And I'll go through and do my for this subrange and apply foo a sub i. It'll work. People have done it. But it really blocks the option of threading building blocks because it's such a pain to do. I mean, we changed either one of these because this is just redundant. Both of these do the same. We've taken, what, three lines that, that have more than a brace on them, turn it into that and said, look at the problem we solved for you. It's still good because you're running in parallel. It's definitely beneficial. It's so hard. We really want to make this better. Well, in the current versions of Intel threading building blocks, now that they have their compiler as well, you can write a parallel for like this from zero one and pass a lambda. Now it's very much like your sequential for loop, but you put parallel underscore in front, and that's the main syntax allows you to bring in the loop body. If you're like me, my personal preference is to write exactly that code in white space. I prefer to put the line breaks like that because it's a parallel for loop, as good as one in the language. Happens to be an but it's a loop, so I prefer to spell it myself as a loop. This is how you spell it in Visual Studio 2010 Parallel Patterns Library. Notice the big difference. Here's Intel's, here's ours. Here's Intel's, here's ours. Say step, but otherwise the syntax is the same and we're going to continue to convert the products. Now, still in the world of parallel. Let's take a look at another example. I have a loop where I'm going to do some work on a lot of packets, and today I'm doing it sequentially. So I have to decorate, compress, and then encrypt every buffer. And we're going to assume they have no side effects and such, so I can automatically parallelize them. Here's one way to do it. Now, you can do this code that will run based on a given pool. Some thread pools you have a dot run method. Some might have a dot launch method. So Syntactic details will differ depending on whether you're using PPL's task group or a thread pool that's called, that uses dot run or something. This is the same structure of the code. The blue outer loop goes through and chunks up items and launches them, just sends them over to be executed. The outer blue code does not do It just goes through and said, okay, here's the next chunk of iterators. Calculates an iterator begin and end position and says, spins off a work, a function object, a lambda, which executed, does that work for every item in that iteration. Then the outer loop goes through and just throws another piece of work, just another piece of work. So the blue code just chunks up the work, and the lambda bodies of all of these chunk pieces of work that have been chunked up spread across the machine by this thread pool or by PPL and use 100 cores or whatever to get the answer faster or six, or however many you have. 
So that's kind of bad because all I've done, here I am writing code that's, that's sequential, where there's nice join points. I start and end code looks sequential and imperative. But this spreads its work across whatever parallelism you happen to have available. You got to write it, notice, by saying pool.run, and now my loop is spinning off, is really a parallel form of while. And you could take that while loop and make a while, a parallel while algorithm if you wanted to that took several of those lines and just packaged them up, simplify the code even further, and then reuse that. So what have we learned? Lambdas make it easy to write parallel loops, parallel decomposition, fork join, because the body that I'm generating, I just toss it somewhere, and I take this and do it somewhere else. And I can give it somewhere, somewhere else to do it. And I don't lose locality of writing. The same techniques I just showed you, even though I'm focusing on people, work in managed TPL and other environments like that as well. Code remains structured in all cases, and that's the important thing because it's very familiar to us, yet lets us have awesome performance and actually use the hardware. Any questions on any of those things in particular? Because I don't think realism is something in particular of interest before we move on to the last section. How many of you have used techniques like with either PPL or TPL? I'm just curious. One, two, three. Okay. How many of you are thinking of running home and, okay, so, uh, and trying out some of these things? Try them out on your laptop. It's probably dual or quad, right? We're geeks, so it's probably round up. So give it a shot and see. Like in Visual Studio 2010, works out of the box. So finally, let's go back and we've looked at all these different examples. And again, the main thing I want you to take away is not any one example, although hopefully useful and interesting, but just how many there are. I mean, we everything from just a local function. I can do that now. Just lambda to a named auto variable. STL algorithms. I, I don't think it's exaggerating to say STL algorithms become 100 usable. I've believed that for the last five years, and I continue to believe it. I think it's exactly what Algorithms like lock and synchronized, or anything I want to while loop or, or to, to recurse or to do on all of those I can write myself once and just use every greater semantic difference. Parallel loops, recursive decomposition, all of those. But now let's look at again a simpler example with just initialization. This is a real world question where somebody encountered a problem and then you know they have proprietary company code, so they distill it to a toy and post it on Usenet and ask, okay, what can I do with this? Can you please? The idea is he's got an integer and then he initializes it to one, but there are several more th steps he needs to take. And so to show a holder those steps, he has a loop that, you know, from two to n plus equals i. So he probably had some proprietary jet work he didn't want to show or something. But let's talk about adding some integers. Now, once initialization on the last blue line, I'm never going to modify the value of x again. I would really love the type system to help me. That's what the type system's for. Please help me with that. In fact, I can say const. Sorry, but we can, so we can say const. And so when we say that x is const, great, it's been initialized. The problem is I can't declare x to be const because after I declare it, I proceed to modify it just a while and then it becomes con. And there's nothing in the type system that I can directly say uh, is about to become const or something. Const doesn't apply in constructors. If this was a class with a constructor that had an integer, yes, I could do that because const doesn't apply in constructors. Getting up the variable and then they become const and immutable. I could do that. You mean I got to write another class to wrap an integer? I just say const in the right place. I would have loved to const int x and at least have the apply after a few lines later. So how can I do that? Well, one attempt is I can take initialization code out and I can stick it somewhere for another function. And then in that other function, I take whatever as a parameter, whatever I was going to, going to use the dynamic end of the range n, and then do the loop, return value, return it, and then below or on, elsewhere, else when, const int x equals x init of n. And that works fine because that's dynamic initialization. Run x init, k 
calculate the value and construct x with it and then it's const. Nice. So the advantage is this works. You can do it. We've done this time. It burns a function name. That's minor. Unless you're doing this a lot, in which case you start naming your functions. It locality. That's the worst thing. I just don't like that. That I have to go somewhere else for the code to initialize it. Now, sometimes that's good. I mean, we do not want to write thousand line functions, and I hope we all have sworn off of those. Even, you know, 150 line functions, we try to swear off. We try to decouple them and make things more modular, so that's good. But what if it, this was just a short function, and here's the initialization, and it really belongs in this one place, which is the only place it's ever going to be used. And I'm losing locality of reference because I'm starting to read my code, constant x equals, and I got to go somewhere else, read that, and then come back here. You know, it's, it could be that that's not desirable here. With lambdas, I can write pretty much exactly the code that that person asked about and put the constant exactly the right place. And all I have to do is to say, oh, by the way, these next few lines are initialization. Let me just wrap those in a lambda. They are exactly the same lines of code, just with square braces and then curly braces around them. And here I go, calculate the value, return the value. The return type is deduced because there's only one return statement. There are no parameters, so I don't need the parens. I don't need the arrow for the return type. I just say constant x equals lambda open brace. And then notice at the end, there's a very important two characters. This is the brace. And then I go paren, paren, which means here's the lambda. I invoke it. So I've created a one-shot function, invoke, and then throw away, because I'm not going to use it again. If I want to use it again, it's same variable in its own right. But there it is. Here's the function, invoke result in x, by the way, x is const. It's just as efficient. We love line stuff. We're the compiler. It retains locality, and the minor thing is that we're in a separate function name, and the code is nice and self-contained. Really, I can write arbitrary initialization of any complex variable, not just something as simple as int. All sorts of places where you might want to write a little code. Use right there to pass it somewhere else. All of those things are things that Lambda's let us do very well. Local functions and initialization through to parallelism, algorithms, TL. As you start to use Lambda, I think you will find that they just get used in more and more places. Uh, the reason why I created this talk was because about, oh, about seven months ago, Arnest Trustrup and I were at a standards meeting, and he said to me over dinner one night, he said, you know, I, I know you Could you just write down somewhere all the, why you think they're so useful? So, as I started writing them down, I, I sometimes I think in PowerPoint. I did. And at the standards meeting in Rapperswil, Switzerland in August, I gave this talk privately to the standards committee and the, the people at the school that was hosting it. And after the talk, I, and I said, this is for you, Bjarne. And we went up and did it. And in the talk, he realized, OK, not one example convinced me, but the number of examples convinced me. And that's what I hope is true of you, too. This was a survey. This was not a complete list. I mean, we got, what? left. This is as much as I can tell you in an hour, but there's more. It's meant to be illustrative of all these different domains you can use lambdas and how they're useful. But here a few more, just in brief summary. Call back continuations. You do the observer pattern. What do you do? You've got to pass it a piece of code to execute as a callback. If you've got a method already ready, pass it a delegate or a point that. No problem. But if there's this handler a fire and that's all it's for, man, give it a lambda. They go, do this when you're done, or do this to fire the notification. Plug-in notification registration. thing if you've got a plug-in like API to get callbacks and say, here is something I want you to do when a certain thing happens. If you have a task continue using TPL, for example. So here is a C-sharp example. <laughs> Look, there's two words of C-sharp in the whole thing. So the task continue with gives you performance. It avoids wake-ups. If you have not yet looked you with and you think, oh, why do I need that? Can I just cobble things together? Read the documentation and write the examples both ways to the performance if you don't believe it. Because just by providing the, like, another lambda or another thing to do as soon as it finishes, instead of sleeping, instead of having that task wait for the first one, then get woken up and continue, just keep right on executing on that same thread. And so you, the, you avoid the overhead of context switches. A continuation pass. If you've ever done, had to do work on the GUI thread, we all wish we didn't have to work on the GUI thread. 
how many of you have wished you didn't have to do work on the GUI thread, but we made you? Right. Why don't you want to do work on the GUI thread? You want the GUI the GUI, what a concept, right? You don't like to have your, your application in the user's face. The user says, please do this operation for me, and then it tries to and drag the window and it goes white. And it, okay, I, in, the, in the meantime, what's he doing? The user's saying the window go white. At least we do that for you now. It's the white window. And we do this, and then the user goes, I wonder if it worked. I'll click it. <laughs> now, when you and it's only because you're in your GUI event loop doing some long the events are there, you're going to get to them. I'm, like, I'm going to get to but you're doing this long thing. And once it's done, then the GUI thread says, oh, look at all these clicks, let me do it. And then the user sits, hits, sits there writing under if he can. We hate that. So what you're supposed to do, never, ever, ever do work on the GUI thread. Always ship it off to some background thread, at least one background to get the work off the GUI thread so the GUI can stay responsive except when we don't let you do that because there are certain things you must do on the GUI. So what do you do with this tension? Well, one thing you can do, first of all, lambdas are great to spin off work to be done on that help if you can. If they must be done on this thread, a pattern, which if you use C-sharp, if you use continuation styles, is in your message handler for that big chunk of work in your GUI, do a little bit of it and then take the rest of itself and, uh, and enqueue yourself with it. Send post message yourself which will then hook up your work into messages. You're constantly feeding yourself your next message. In the meantime, anything that's come in, you can handle. And that's the kind of thing that's responsive. So if you must do it on the GUI thread, lambdas are a very convenient way of chunking yourself up by the rest of your work as a lambda to yourself, which gets enqueued and interleaved with all the other work. And if you must, you prefer to get it off the GUI thread. You're good there too, but just FYI. Functors. I honestly am not sure if there is any use left for locally used functors. Function objects that you only ever use in your function body. You declare, you know, as a full class and, you know, class my functor, constructor, and then the function call operator. I don't know if we ever need to write one of those again. And I just write auto my functor equals I just created the object. Look, there it is. I didn't have to write all the I just wrote, this is the function. Oh, by the way, I get really easy for capturing stuff. I think those will probably, at least mostly, probably entirely. More examples. But here are the common characteristics. We want to treat a piece of code as an object, typically to pass it around. And it's just like, it's just like a function object. We just want to invoke it later, principally, or by somebody else. And the code is naturally local. The site that has the code generally knows what it is we want to do. We hand it off to somebody else to do it, to do it in a certain way or in a certain place or in a certain thread context. That work is easy to encapsulate and should stay in the scope. If I had shown you those last two lines at the beginning of the slide, you might have think, yeah, how many of those really are? There places where you treat code as an object, but the only place you ever use it, you wouldn't write something more general convinced you that that's actually a, a much more common case than we might have thought. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing this tour. Um, if you have questions, please come up afterwards, and I'll hang around for anybody who wants to know about Lambdas and C Sharp and C++. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. And Lambdas, Lambdas, more or less everywhere. So thank you for coming and enjoy PDC.